Welcome to Radara, and today we are talking with Richard Prum, uh, the author of The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choice Shapes the Animal World and Us. Welcome to Radara. Thank you very much. Professor Prum, obviously, is a professor, researcher, and also an author. And uh, you have been teaching at Yale University, a Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I've been here for uh, uh, since 2004, and most of that time focusing on the evolution of birds. You got interested in the birds at a very early age, and you start off in the book saying that. And tell us how you got interested in birds. Well, you know, I was a nerdy kid, read a lot, and <laughs> and I was definitely interested in nonfiction. You know, I remember getting my first copy of the Guinness Book of World Records uh, at about six or seven. And I, I find it fascinating, and I just loved all the endless detail. And I would learn the records, especially of the, the fattest person and, and who ate the most whelks and other, other gastronomic records uh, that they've, they've eliminated from the book now. And I would make my siblings uh, test me on them as a quiz. About in fourth grade, I got my first pair of glasses. And within months, I was a bird watcher. I think it was really that the the outer world came into focus and maybe accidentally the, some of the first things that it that it came upon were birds. Uh, I was uh, grew up in, in a small town in southern Vermont and uh, so we had woods and fields and marshes around us and the combination of binoculars, uh, my glasses and a bird book led me out the back door and into the natural world and uh, and I've been bitten by this bug uh, ever since. And unlike birds you never migrated out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well I but but, but birds have uh, <laughs> taken me all over the planet. So I have, uh, you know, and that was really the thing I saw immediately as a child. The inventions I imagined through uh, bird watching and later science was sort of a ticket to the pages of National Geographic magazine, right? That kind of sense of adventure and the hunt and the excitement of the study of the natural world was suddenly accessible to me in, in little parts, but also leading into the future. And it has. I, I have, I've had the pleasure to go lots of different places to watch birds. Never enough, though. Mm -hmm. Tell us what, why did you write this book and what is this book has about? What is the central theme? Well, I have a uh, pleasure in my ornithological career to work on lots of different things. That include the behavior of birds, their song, the little, the anatomy that they sing with called the syrinx. Uh, I've worked on the phylogeny of birds, which is a sort of uh, understanding who is related to whom within the tree of life. Uh, I've worked on color and how birds perceive color. And a large part of this research has been done, you know, because of the uh, you know, it, it's not applied. It's just for the curiosity of it. And, and of course, when that l is leading you, you don't stop to think why you're interested in anything. You just, you just do the next fun project because it's fascinating and, and, and rewarding in the moment. So believe it or not, I was sort of decades into my career before I started realizing well, what am I actually doing here? <laughs> and, uh, and in that sense, I, I realized that a large portion of my work was about one big topic that I had never directly addressed, and that was the evolution of beauty. And beauty here means, of course, beauty is very motivating to me to study beautiful birds, but I don't mean beauty as we see it, but beauty as the birds perceive it. And the idea that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves. And, and this, this fascinating perspective that has really motivated a lot of my research is actually kind of a, a, a minority opinion within the sciences. And it was really through the motivation to try to, to change how people think about beauty in the natural world and, it's, and, and how it arises that, uh, that led me to write write this book. I'm, I, really, I'm, I really hope to change the way people think and transform their own relationship to, to nature through this, uh, this view of science. Very fascinating. We'll get to humans. So first, we'll deal with birds and then animals and then humans at last. <laughs> sure. What is that have you discovered and how birds think about beauty and uh, how this whole ecological phenomenon that we see out there, how birds like each other, how birds talk to each other, how birds communicate with each other, but more important, how birds perceive each other? 
Yeah. So, so one aspect of this view of this aesthetic view of beauty in nature is the idea that we need to really embrace the subjective experiences of animals. Uh, and what I mean by that is the, the internal neural and cognitive events that are involved in what it is for a bird to choose a particular mate, what it is for a bird to like a plumage or prefer a certain kind of song. And what this means, we have to get into the heads of birds. Now, we can't get into the heads of birds because we can't communicate them. It's even difficult and limited in humans, right? There's no way for you and me to absolutely guarantee that we're having the same perception of the color red or of a Mozart symphony, right? These are internal events. Um, but even though they're scientifically difficult to reduce or measure, that doesn't mean we can't study them. And in fact, uh, I think people have, uh, in science have mistaken the difficulty of studying the subjective experience of animals with like, some kind of boundary of science saying that we can't do it. And as a result, most of evolutionary biology has been involved in trying to explain away the subjective experiences of animals, not explain them. And what I mean by that is rather than imagine that animals actually prefer or like things, we try to explain in some practical sense why beauty arises, right? And this has led to the dominant view that, that ornament in nature, especially sexual ornament, evolves because it provides information that other mates need to know. And it's information that's both objective and about the quality of mates. So I refer to this as the sort of biological match.com profile view of beauty, that uh, the beauty of birds is like a rap sheet filled with uh, uh, of information. Now, who is this individual? Who are his people? Does he come from a good egg? Does he come from a good family? Does he have money in the bank? Does he have a good diet? Does he have sexually transmitted diseases? These are all the sorts of things, the practical things that mates might want to know. And, and my own research has led me in various ways to support and to be interested in an alternative theory that uh, most of ornament in nature is merely beautiful, that it evolves because it's attractive and not because it's practical. And this leads to uh, a real challenge to the, to the idea of adaptation and natural selection as a strong force dictates most or all of what we need to know uh, about evolutionary process. So my, uh, my work is headed in a, in a different direction, and it requires that we actually think about how animals, how animals think, how they perceive mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have two fascinating chapters for chapter one and two, where you talk about Darwin's really dangerous idea, and then you say beauty happens. So explain to us a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So, so this idea, this aesthetic view of beauty is not originated with me. It goes back to the origin of the first explanation of the evolution of beauty in nature uh, from Darwin himself. And Darwin had proposed, uh, well, at the end of the descent, Darwin had a couple of problems. He, uh, he, or a few problems. He didn't, he didn't have any theory of genetics. Uh, he had no elaborated hypothesis or description of human evolution. And he had no explanation for what he called impracticable beauty, like the peacock's tail. And he wrote at uh, this time uh, between after uh, origin, he wrote to Asa Gray, an American botanist, he said, the sight of uh, the eye and the peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. <laughs> and, 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 and why sick? Well, because he saw it as an intellectual challenge to uh, his, you know, powerful explanation of the origin of uh, natural diversity. That was natural selection, adaptation by natural selection. So Darwin's thought seriously in another decade or so. He wrote a second book called Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And in that book, he proposed an alternative mechanism of evolution rather than natural selection, which was the result of differential survival and fecundity, differential numbers of babies or the capacity to raise babies and survival in organisms. He proposed a mechanism, what he called sexual selection, which had two components. One was competition within one sex for control over the other. Uh, this is mostly males and it uh, would give rise to the evolution of antlers and other armaments. And he had a hypothesis about the evolution of ornament through mate choice, where members of one sex choose their mates on the basis of some displays by the other sex. And it was this evolution by mate choice that was uh, the source of ornament and nature. Of course, Darwin used explicitly aesthetic language. He talked about beauty as a charm uh, 
uh, or as uh, mating preferences as an aesthetic capacity. He talked about the kinds of uh, judgments that animals were applying to each other as standards of beauty. So he used everyday language of beauty to describe animals. And this was because it was his, uh, his main feature that this was not natural selection, that it could be in concert with natural selection, but that often it was entirely for its own sake, that animals had evolved and co-evolved the concept of beauty with the ornaments that they preferred. So that idea was criticized at the time. In particular, Darwin's idea of, of male-male competition was so in line with the Victorian era that it was immediately adopted and probably as great evidence of evolution itself. But his notion that female animals were making aesthetic choices and that female choice was therefore a force in nature were really radical and they were attacked and rejected by most biologists. Some of the attacks were explicitly misogynistic. So a guy named uh, St. George Marvart, he said that uh, he described mate choice as vicious feminine caprice. That, and in that case, in those days, vicious meant not just uh, aggressive, and, but, uh, but actually full of vice or immoral. So he, they saw this as an immoral challenge, you know. Uh, and also they saw Darwin as a traitor to his own cause uh, as, the, uh, as the discoverer of natural selection, uh, that, this web, that natural selection was not the all-powerful explanation of nature. So really Darwin's idea of mate choice was rejected. Uh, the most powerful critic was actually his co-discoverer of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace. And Wallace was the one who basically said, uh, if it's ever going to occur, it's going to occur only through if mate choice is acting to get the most vigorous, the best, and the fittest male uh, or the fittest mate. And in those conditions, that would give rise to a, a process that was entirely like natural selection. And therefore, we should throw out Darwin's concept of sexual selection and just talk about adaptation. So those were the early days. The reason why Darwin's idea, this was really dangerous idea, or this, the reason why mate choice was Darwin's really dangerous idea was that it challenged uh, the idea of natural selection as an all-powerful evolutionary mechanism. And this is the same challenge that my book presents to modern biologists, because although most biologists think of themselves as Darwinian and following in Darwin's footsteps, they're actually in the area of mate choice, they're following Wallace because the, the biomatch.com profile idea is a, is a pure Wallacean idea. This is the idea that, you know, that the peacock's tail or the wood thrush song is giving information about the quality of that individual as opposed to being merely popular or merely attractive, right? So this is an idea so dangerous that it had to be uh, laundered out of Darwinism itself. So although uh, modern biology uh, thinks of itself as Darwinian, it's really aggressively anti-Darwinian. And, and, and that's part of the, uh, the disruptive uh, impact I hope the book can have. Yes, yes. And as you mentioned, it's a process. And I think you have in the chapter, Aesthetic Innovation and Decadence. Yeah. So in particular, one of the ways in which we can see the distinction between the evolution by natural selection and some independent force of sexual selection is when they're going in opposite directions, right? So one of the ways we can see that it's going in the opposite direction is when when mate choice makes individuals worse off, right? Uh, and this is a a complex problem because most people have thought uh, that obviously things like the peacock's tail are very costly. Uh, the tail is four feet long. It's trailing behind the male. It's clear that he's going to have more likely to be eaten by a tiger or, or it's going to have trouble flying as a result of having this huge tail. But um, starting with in the 1970s, modern biologists have rationalized these costs as as an indicator of investment. So that if the male puts lots of uh, energy into growing a huge tail and then displaying it, uh, he's like a wealthy man displaying that he's got quality to waste. He's got money or in this case, energy to expend in a useless ornament, right? So this was called the handicap principle that actually advertisers are made worse by their displays, right? And so that seemed to get around it. But in, in recent work, I've been looking at some ornaments and how they're distributed among the sexes. And I think that leads to a new conclusion about investments. They can actually be decadent. They can actually make all individuals worse in nature. And a great example is this bird I have worked on for years called the club-winged mannequin. 
the mannequin is a, or the mannequins are a family of South American birds that are uh, where the females do the nesting and the males do displays. The females visit the males and choose the display they like. And as a result, we have strong sexual selection and all sorts of ornaments, crazy ornaments. But in particular, the club wing mannequin has an unusual song. He actually sings with his wings. And it's a kind of stridulation, like a cricket, where the feathers rub together to make a sound that sounds like pip, pip, wang. It's like a little violin-like ringing note. And this is sort of a harmonic sound made with feathers. Very unusual, very innovative. Now, in order to, to make that sound, we have discovered that uh, in the mannequins, beauty is not only skin deep. In order to make those beautiful wing songs that females prefer, the males have evolutionarily transformed their wing muscles and wing bones. In particular, the ulna, which is the trailing bone in the forewing, uh, has become huge and solid like ivory. That's a big deal because every other species of bird has a hollow ulna. Even Tyrannosaurus rex had a hollow ulna. So going all the way back to the dinosaurs, uh, their bones, these wing bones, uh, limb bones have been hollow. So that's a big deal. Uh, however, it can still be rationalized as a handicap. So I started looking at the females. And what I found recently is that the female club wing mannequin also has an enormous ulna. For scientists out there, it's three standard deviations above the mean in terms of robustness. It's the weirdest ulna in birds, except for the penguin, which of course is flightless. <laughs> so this indicates that in order to make this sound, these birds have wing bones that make them worse at flying. Interestingly, the female also has wing bones that make likely make her worse at flight and, and performance. Uh, so how does that work? Well, she chooses the male with the wing song that she loves. And her daughters inherit genes for wing bones that make them worse at flying. But her sons also inherit genes for singing beautiful songs. So the costs are traded off by the sexual advantage. And as a result, this kind of runaway process uh, can lead to an elaboration of a display trait that makes everybody, males and females, worse off. In theory, there's nothing to keep this process from leading to extinction. I don't think that's happening right now in club wing mannequin, but it is certainly very far. Females and males are very far from the natural selection optimum. So that tells us that sexual selection, mate choice, is an independent force uh, that can go in in an absolutely opposing direction. And I think that's, uh, that's, the, that's sort of the, the uh, natural experiment that allows us to understand that natural and sexual selection are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I mean, evolution happens, but we make it happen. And that, that, yeah, that mate choice is not an adaptive process uh, necessarily. Yes, and, and so the, the way I describe this is, is, as I describe in the book, is beauty happens. That's my uh, mantra, if you will, for this area of science. And what that means is whenever there's sensory perception cognitive evaluation or judgment and, and the opportunity for choice, the freedom of choice, then beauty will arise. Beauty arises in nature as an emergent property of those, of those uh, conditions uh, and gives rise to a, a distinct kind of mechanism uh, that, uh, with a distinct uh, pattern of evolutionary phenomena. Wow. And then you move on to the beauty from the beast. Yes. Well, you know, the, one of the things that's challenging about this is that we've identified sort of the power of choice right? The power of choice, sexual choice in particular in nature is to create beauty. But it also gives us a new perspective on what happened when choice is infringed, in particular by sexual conflict and sexual violence, right? And, and this is a difficult topic because it's really about forced copulation in, in nature uh, for random reasons. <laughs> I uh, was working with a, 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 a fantastic researcher, Patricia Brennan, now at Mount Holyoke College, and she came to my lab as a, as a postdoctoral uh, fellow, and she was interested in studying the evolution of avian genitalia. Most people don't know that some birds still have a penis, but because almost all birds don't, but in particular, uh, she was interested in some of these birds that do. And so we ended up working on waterfowl uh, with an interest primarily in anatomy and its evolution. But what we discovered was uh, a striking new observations about breeding biology and, and anatomy of, of ducks. Uh, in particular, uh, we worked on a lot of ducks where there's still a penis present. And in some cases, this penis can be pretty shockingly long. So for the uh, Argentine lake duck, uh, which is a pretty small duck from South America, the penis is actually longer than the body of the male. Uh, 
And the question really was, what is that thing doing in the female? How does this happen? How does this function? And of course, Patty took the, uh, Patricia Brennan took the, took the female perspective and started understanding it. Well, what was known was that the penis gets larger or evolves to be larger in species with lots of forced copulations. In, in duck biology, usually a, a pair, the male and female, form a pair and then proceed to migrate to the, the breeding area. But there are excess males, and in, at the time of breeding, when the eggs are laid, other males will attempt to force copulations on the female and, try, and attempt to, to father her offspring. It's quite clear that these are forced copulations. The, female, the male and the female are in during, uh, during solicited copulations do these elaborate display behaviors. In this case, the female struggles and tries to, tries to leave. What we found out was that some of the unusual features of the duck penis were correspondingly associated with elaborate and unusual features features of the female duck vagina. Uh, and for this, we need a little more, uh, a little more duck uh, anatomy. But basically, the, the duck penis is, is counterclockwise spiraled. And it also has lymphatic erection, which means that instead of using blood to become stiff, it uses lymph system and it erects immediately, like explosively. So in this case, a 30 centimeter or 25 centimeter duck penis can evert in a third of a second. So it's really quite rapid. And so what we found out was, what Patty discovered was that ducks have co-evolved in response to the elaboration of the penis, they have co-evolved complex vaginal structures that exclude the penis during forced copulations. That is, they prevent the penis from entering fully into the female reproductive tract. In particular, that some of the places are like a dead-end cul-de-sac, an off pocket uh, in the vaginal passage. The, and above those, they have a, a series of clockwise spirals. So these are literally anti-screw devices that prevent the intromission during forced copulations. And of course, the female can allow intromission during solicited copulations just fine. So we were, of course, struck with the idea, how does this evolve? And the answer is because forced copulations or forced fertilizations create a genetic loss to the female. So if the female mates with the male she likes as a result of his display, so this is the green head and the quack, 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 and all the elaborate dances that most ducks do. If she mates with the male she prefers, then her male offspring will inherit those traits and will be preferred by other females. That's the indirect genetic benefit of mate choice that drives the evolution of beauty. But if her mate choices are infringed, by coercion, then her offspring will not inherit the traits that she prefers. There'll either be a random trait or maybe even one she's explicitly rejected. So in that case, uh, her offspring are less likely to be attractive to other females. So that will be a genetic cost to her fitness. As a result, anything she can do or any anatomical feature she evolves that allow her to maintain her freedom of choice will evolve. And so what this means, the bottom line of the, our work on duck sex is that sexual autonomy, the freedom of choice matters to animals. There is an evolutionary difference between getting what you want and not getting what you want. And this is uh, really striking and I think really challenges the way in which evolutionary biologists thought both about beauty and about, uh, about choice. So sexual autonomy, this freedom of choice, was not a concept invented by suffragettes and feminists, but is also a feature of the natural world, of social sexual species and sexual conflict in the natural world. And so uh, that was a, you know, a new discovery about the implications uh, for beauty. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, the uh the difficulty with duck sex is it becomes an arms race. The males evolve a more elaborate uh, and well-armed penis, the females eva uh, evolve more complicated structures. And the females are still winning, if you will. In species where 40 or 50 percent of the copulations are forced copulations, only two to three percent of the offspring in the nest are, are actually the result of forced copulation. So, so females are really good at this, but they are paying a huge cost. So that's an arms race, and it leads to both, uh, it leads to lots of costs. There's an, but we've discovered it, other mechanisms which it can work, and, and that ref is when females use choice, uh, their mate choice, to change males in ways that further their freedom of choice. Uh, 
And a great example of this is um, the bowerbirds. Bowerbirds are these beautiful, elaborate, aesthetic birds from Australia and New Guinea. And uh, uh, the male builds, the female does the nesting. She builds the nest, raises the young all on her own, and she visits the males at these male display sites. And the males build what's called a bower. It's not a nest, but it's an elaborate construction made of sticks and also surrounded by uh, ornamental ornaments, different sorts of things. In some species, it's all about blue, blue flowers, blue feathers, and of course, even blue straws or pen tops or milk bottle tops. Uh, that's in the, in the satin bowerbird. Other species, it will be all white objects. So they, they, they decorate their bower with these objects. So the female visits the bower and chooses her male. Now, the males make the bowers because because the females want them. They have co-evolved uh, preferences for the bowers and they've elaborated and aesthetically in all these ways. But the bower also provides a female with a refuge as well. Most of the bowers or many of the bowers have a sort of a, a little niche between two walls. It's called an avenue bower. It looks like kind of like a, a, a U shape and the female sits in the middle and she's protected on both sides from the wall. And in the front, the male does his dances. Well, if the male wants to copulate, he has to go around the back he, she is protected from him by the walls. He has to go around the back and approach her from behind, which gives her a chance to pop out the front if she wants to. So this means that the male makes a construction that is aesthetic, that's beautiful, but it also protects her. So her preferences evolved in a way that allow her to maintain her freedom of choice. And we call this aesthetic remodeling. And, and that I think is another aspect of the interaction of choice and coercion that gives rise to a, a, a new thoughts about how, how animals evolve. And in particular, on the, the bromance part, we have a, another phenomenon in nature called lecking, where the males aggregate in their display sites. And essentially, they cooperate with each other in order to attract females. Of course, the males don't want to cooperate. There's no reason why they should. And I think that the real cooperation is a result of females. Females mate in groups or choose mates in groups where the males get along and, and not in the uh, groups where they fight. And so the males have got to get along in order, for the, in order to have any sexual success. So even if they're competitors, they must get along or the females will go elsewhere. And so that transforms slowly maleness into, into a more cooperative form, which allows females to make the sexual choices they want. So the, the other thing is, what are animals doing with their freedom of choice? Well, they're choosing beauty. And in groups where we see this phenomena happening, we see an explosion, what I call an aesthetic radiation uh, in the varieties of beauty. And that's a that's a that's a that's a, also a a fundamental notion for how how evolution works. Fascinating. Moving on, the um, I guess in the beauty happens in the uh, in the beast. It happens in the birds, and it happens also in the humans. Then, right. So I, I you know the uh, although I am a bird guy of my training, and most of my research is on birds. Uh, uh, the last third of the book is about human evolution, and uh, the reason I did that is for a couple of reasons. One, it's, uh, it, it's really important to do. Human sexuality is a, is a topic that uh, everybody's fascinated about. And it's also one that has been subjected almost exclusively to analysis by, uh, by the adaptationist view, by the Wallacean view. So the, the actual Darwinian view of beauty has rarely been uh, applied to, to, to humans in, in, in recent, uh, well, it, it, certainly for decades. So that was good fun. And also, I think that the Wallacean view, the view that all of human beauty is revealing inner inner genetic quality or the quality of people. Uh, I, I think it's had a very corrosive effect on our culture with young people imagining that every, uh, you know, uh, adolescence is bad enough. Now put on top of this uh, science, most of which is poorly formed, telling people that every asymmetry or every bulge and bump is, is revealing their, their inner genetic value. That's corrosive. And I think it's just bad science on top of it. So yes, I spent quite a bit of time critiquing the idea that human beauty is evolved through uh, as an adaptive process. I think uh, most of the varieties of human beauty are overwhelmingly arbitrary and that the, that the evidence uh, for adaptations in human ornaments is, 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 uh, is very poor. And this aesthetic view of life is not something we all have shared and that you're fascinated in, in, a, in a very nice way you kind of summarize in the chapter 12. Yeah, well, you know, thinking about uh, aesthetic evolution as a natural process has lots of implications for the relationship between evolutionary biology and the rest of the culture, right? And that's an important thing. In particular, uh, aesthetics is not just a human property, but 
across lots and lots of animals, then that uh, really has important implications for, for our own uh, aesthetic explorations of art and, uh, and for the humanities. You know, if mate choice is not always an adaptive process, then that has really important implications for how we think about human evolution and, uh, and culture and anthropology. So there's all these different threads, all these different ways in with which an aesthetic view of life can transform the way we, 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 we think about the natural world and ourselves in it. And uh, that was the, uh, where I hope the book can go uh, as we think about this topic in, in, in the future. Very fascinating. Thank you very much for your time and your comments. This is uh, this has been a very educational and learning experience. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, to to speak to you and to your listeners. And I hope your readers uh, enjoy the book. Uh, yes, hope, and hopefully uh, we'll change some minds and some conventional thinking that is out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you write, decide to write another book, let us know.